In order to create our extension in FreePBX, we first need to start out by uh, logging in to our web interface. Now, this is done through a web browser. You can use Chrome, Internet Explorer, uh, Mozilla. Uh, I found that the best browser for this is to use Chrome. Uh, you just enter the IP address or the DNS name into the web browser bar and hit enter and you'll be presented with a screen similar to this one. At this point you can type in the username you've been given. Uh, typically this will be given to you by someone who set up your system, your system administrator, or what have you. In our case, this is administrator. And then I'll go ahead and type in the password. Remember that the password is case sensitive. I go ahead and click on the login button. And when I do that, we'll be presented with the free PBX main statistics page. Now, we're not going to go through in this video, we're not going to go through all of the settings, but we will go through how to set up an extension. And that can be found under the Applications menu. Go down to where it says Extensions. Now, it should be noted that an extension is simply something that you could connect to the phone system in order to make and receive phone calls. Um, it is identified usually by a number, and then it's given a name so that we can more easily recognize it. Um, there are a few other parameters which we'll go through. The first thing though you need to decide is what kind of device you're going to be hooking up. Um, the most common is a SIP device. Now there's a lot of phone, there's a lot of different types you can hook up here, but the SIP is probably the most common. And I would say unless you've got an all analog system, if you're using IP phones, it's a good possibility that they're SIP devices. Um, the IAX2 devices, that has to do with specific asterisk phones, any device that is capable of communicating directly with asterisk uses the IAX protocol. Um, you'll be able to look at a phone and see if it can do that. Um, Zap and Dottie are two types of devices which we won't cover here but essentially what it means is those are types of devices that are connected via typically analog lines, um, regular two-wire phones, and then there's also possibilities of doing other or virtual extensions. Virtual extensions like if you just want to be able to dial a number and hit voicemail. Uh, you can think of this like a voicemail box. A voicemail box only. You're never going to connect a phone to it. So for the purposes of this, let's pretend like we are setting up a phone. So let's go ahead and we're going to make a generic SIP device. Then we click Submit. Now, there are, as you can see, there are tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of options. Now, what I'm going to go through here is I'm going to show you the most commonly used or commonly entered fields. The first one we need to choose here is called user extension. And what this is, is it's a series of numbers, typically three or four digits. Um, in smaller companies use three, larger companies use four. You can use, you know, five even if you wanted to, but it's got to be unique within the system. It's got to be something that's easy to remember. So um, most people come up with a standard and then stick to it. You might start at uh, 5,000, go up to 5,001, 5,002. Some people start at 200, go to 201, 202, 203, and so on. But I'm just going to pick a number here. Um, by looking on the left, it looks like 4,000 is available. So I'm going to make an extension number 4,000. And I'm going to call this, uh, the display name is the next property we're going to use, and that's called um, like the name of what this extension is. Now, usually it's the person's first and last name separated by a space. So we're going to say Bob Smith. Okay. Now, the really the, the major required ones, user extension is a required field. Uh, display name is also required uh, just so that you can see it. You could just put the number in here again if you wanted to. Uh, we're going to scroll down and you, there's another field here that says outbound CID. That stands for outbound caller ID. And you could put a number in here so that if you were dialing out, it would show that number whenever you dialed out. So this would override any system caller IDs. This is often used if you have a direct number and you want it so that when you call out, it shows the direct number. But for the purposes of this, I'm not going to put one in here. Um, you can kind of, actually, if you want to know what any of these individual settings are, you can actually 
hover your mouse over, you could, there's a little space to the right where your, num your pointer turns into a hand, and it will tell you exactly what this particular setting does. Okay, to continue on, this is where you would set up a direct inward number. Now, you only need you can only set this up if you have direct DID numbers. Those are given to you by your phone company, a typically 10-digit number. They'll be assigned to you in a block, and a DID number can only be assigned to one thing. For example, you can assign a DID number to a auto attendant. You can assign a DID number to an extension. You could also assign a DID number to a ring group or a queue. But the point is you can't duplicate it. You can't assign a DID number to one thing and another thing. Um, we're not going to actually fill one out here because I don't have a number to give this extension. If you don't give it a DID, that's fine. You, people internally can still dial the number. You could have it come into, say, an operator, and then they could transfer it to this extension, which was 4,000. The next item down here we have is secret. Now, secret is just a password. And the passwords, in order to prevent toll fraud, they should be something that's fairly complicated, a mixture of upper and lowercase letters, and then numbers. So I like to just start picking. and uh, I don't like to use special characters unless absolutely necessary. Uh, like, this is what I might put for a password. You know, fairly long, fairly complicated, and it is case sensitive. This would be one that's not a dictionary word not a series of numbers so that they couldn't just guess it. Uh, it makes it easier for people to prevent, you know, hooking up a phone without knowing the password, without guessing the password and being able to make free phone calls, which, as we know, would be a bad thing. Uh, so the next thing we need to put in here, we're going to leave those settings as standard for now. Those will work for most of the applications. We'll cover some of these settings in a later video. Okay. Um, then in addition, we have well, probably one of the most common settings is voicemail. Now some extensions you don't want to have voicemail. For example, let's say you have a phone in a common area, like a hallway phone or a reception phone. You normally don't want those to have voicemail because, you know, who's going to check it? Um, you just want it to ring, 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 or maybe hang up or ring ring and then go somewhere else. But in this case this is a person so we're gonna go ahead and enable it. Now the voicemail password should be something that is you know several characters, several numbers it can only be numbers because you use your phone pad to enter the number. Uh, we're gonna enter one two three four. Now when you first log into the voicemail box after it's been created, it will ask you to set up your voicemail box. And what happens then is it will ask you to pick a password, record your name, and record a greeting. And so all of this will change once you've logged into that voicemail box. You could also choose a, you know, fairly easy to remember password, but fairly long. So we're just actually we'll leave it at that. Now, your email address. The email address, what that does is it allows the system to notify you when you have a voicemail. So I'm going to put my email address in here. And now it will email me whenever I get a voicemail saying, hey, you have a voicemail in your voicemail box. This next field that says email attachment if you click that to yes, it will actually attach the voicemail to the email when it emails it. So you can listen to it without ever having to actually log into your voicemail box. Now these next few buttons also control how the voicemail system works. Play CID stands for play the caller ID. The system will say you have a, fo you have a voicemail from 7142221234 and it plays the whole thing out which it sounds great and for for like one or two times but after you've listened to voicemails and you listen to 10 messages it gets kind of annoying so most of the time i tell people to leave this off play envelope again i recommend this setting be set to off but what it does is it plays the time and the date that the left the message was left 
allows you to see like exactly when a left message was left without having to go in and play the actual envelope. You can play it without setting this to on. You just have to go through the menu in the voicemail system. Okay, and then delete voicemail works along with this email attachment. So if you have this set to yes and delete voicemail set to yes, what will happen is it will email you the voicemail and then delete the voicemail from the system. And what's nice about that is you never have to go in and clear out your voicemails. By default, there's a limit of 100 voicemails. So once your mailbox fills up, that's it. You can't leave any more voicemails. So if you never go in and check your voicemails, that would be a problem. Eventually, you would forget to check it, and one day, nobody, hey, I can't leave you a voicemail. What's going on? Well, that's because nobody logged in to check their voicemail. So you would check this to yes, and again, that would then, the system would, you'd leave a voicemail, the system would email you the voicemail, and then because we have this checked, it would delete the voicemail. But because we're kind of, because I'm kind of uh, cautious, I'm going to go ahead and leave set that to no. Okay, these last settings aren't really needed. I just want to make special note here. This section here that says Mac address, brand, model, line, and template, this is to automatically configure a phone at the same time that you're configuring this extension. But we're going to cover that in another video about uh, using the endpoint manager, and we'll talk about that later. So once we've finished, we go ahead and click Submit. And if there are any errors, it will tell us. But no, everything went successful. You notice it doesn't pop up with anything that says successful. But how we tell is we look over here in the right and you can see Bob Smith was created. Okay. Now in order to make this change permanent, we go ahead and click Apply Config. You'll see the reloading bar. Once it comes back up without the Apply Config button, we know that it was successfully created. Now there's one last thing we can do here to check that it was created successfully. Under the Reports menu, there's an item that says asterisk info. If I click on that, this tells me everything about what's happening with asterisk. And if I go over here to the right where it says peers, because I made a SIP peer, this will only work by the way if you're using SIP. If you have an IAX um, extension, you'll see it here under IAX. But I made peer 4000 and you can see it right there. Now you'll notice these other ones have addresses and OK. Mine says unknown and unspecified. That's because I haven't hooked up a phone to it yet. Okay. Until you hook up a phone and connect it to the system, the extension, while you could dial it right now, it would just go right to voicemail because there's no phone hooked up to it. It can't ring anything. So that is the end of our demonstration. Uh, check back for more demonstrations soon.